we hope that we see more Black Swana stuff to come, and we hope that we've contributed in even a really small way with this issue. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'm going to set myself a timer, first of all. Uh, <laughs> And I will be reading a draft of a story that I've been working on for a long time, but never quite feels like finished or ready. So please do bear with me. Uh, OK, it's called The Revelation. The revelation came down around daybreak. When it reached Fatima's ears, she let out, she let out a cry. She turned towards the window abruptly. Saying one last mm-hmm, she clanged the phone down on the kitchen counter. Who was that? Bess asked her mother. Her stomach turned. She had known from the first tinny ring what this was about. It was now a question of the messenger. She had known earlier than that when she found herself wide awake at night, her mother shifting restlessly beside her. She had known moments before that even when she dreamed that a mob of people were at their doorstep. Through the peephole, Bess could see dozens of snarling faces laughing at her. The men looked identical, with curling lips that stretched their narrow faces. They pounded at the door until the walls of their queen's one-bedroom apartment shook. They jostled against each other and the walls of the hallway, which they filled entirely. One man, who had a pink tongue that sharpened to a point, led the pack. He came closer and closer to the peephole with bulging eyes until Bess realized in horror that somehow he could see her too. It was the sheikh who called, her mom said. So it was worse than she thought. Fatima did not turn around to face Bess. Her thin silhouette was stark against the acrid pink of the sky. Bess felt nauseous. The dread that had settled into her stomach yesterday twisted inside of her. If the sheikh knew, who else did? Did everyone know? He wants to talk to you about Noor. Noor came back to her, her profile in the semi-dark, the hook of her nose, the softness of her mouth, that dimpled smile of hers, the threat it carried. Bess looked past Fatima out the window into the gridlock streets. They were half an hour away from the earliest prayer. Even the strongest believers would be asleep. The streets were gray and silent, not only in their neighborhood, but all across the city. Fatima pushed down the lip of the open window clicked off and clicked off the tea, tea kettle. Nor and Malika are already in the mosque. Fatima returned the phone to its power base in the living room. Her long black jilbab swished between her legs as she walked. As her mother rushed around her, Bess felt a slowing of time, which warped around her body in an unfamiliar way. Will something happen to Noor? Bess asked. Fatima made a few strides over to the hallway coat rack. Bess stood, finally. The plastic of the chair under her squeaked. I don't know. Fatima answered. She wore an expression on her face usually res reserved for deciphering tax forms, census papers, overdue rent notices. It was one that reflected a fear of the unknown and the desire to mask that fear. It pinched her delicate features together and shrank her already petite frame. It was haunting. They hurtled down the four blocks and two avenues to the mosque. The wind bit through them, warning about the winter ahead. Bess lagged behind her mother like she was a child again. The numbness that had set into her body earlier caught her at the hips, slowing the parabola of her legs. Although Bess was moving as fast as she could, the gap between mother and daughter widened. Soon, Bess was alone. Sweating, she stumbled with difficulty through the route that she had taken almost every day of her life. A once familiar intersection was now alien in its flashing reds and greens and yellows. The chain link covering the key foods glinted at her oddly. Across the street, the bodega cat that usually took root between dusty Fanta bottles at the window was gone, asleep, or dead. Yesterday, a cat, the cat, a calico, had trailed at her heels as she picked up groceries for her mother. She had crouched in the narrow middle aisle, rifling through Goya cans on the bottom shelf. They were cold, their taut labels blurry. Every time they crimped into focus, Bess Nor leaned into her, letting out that first exhale from her lips, and they blurred again. Bess rocked back into her knees, startling the cat. What was it that her mom wanted? Was it the pinto beans? The kiss had been deep. 
In the background, a staticky Egyptian radio station analyzed the latest from the war. Sorry. Her mom had mentioned something about making food that morning. It was shocking to Bess that there was a this morning, a before, and anything else. Like they had not parted ways. Bess was dizzy with the smell of Noor. Her Bath and Body Works perfume, the acrid rem remnants of a Marlboro, the scent of felt-tipped markers. Should she call her mother to be safe? The Nokia in her pocket was so close, but so far away. Bess settled on the fava beans. She pulled two cans from the sh shelf. If anything, she could come back. A pair of black boots interrupted her periphery. Somewhere from, be from within the newscaster's voice, Bess heard her name. Her heart rate jumped as she looked up. Was it clear what she had been thinking a few seconds ago? Amel, one of the older women from her mother's prayer circle, looked down at Bess with an expectant expression. Salaamu Alaikum, Bess said, standing up. Simhaliya, pardon me. Averting her gaze, she tried to sidestep the woman, bulky in her gray jilbab and matching scarf, but Amel cut in front of her again. With sour breath, she leaned into Bess. I saw you guys, she said. Her face was twisted in a sorrowful expression. In the corner of Emil's mouth was a fleck of spit. It glimmered when she pursed her lips. Qadu's mouth, she had named Emil to her mother when they were on better terms. Bess tried again to move, but Emil grabbed her shoulder. Her grip was tight, even on top of Bess's jacket. I saw you guys. I saw you both on the train. Before she could think, Bess looked up startled into Emel's flinty eyes. She shook herself loose. Emel's expression moved from sorrow to vindication. A slow horror yawned, dawned into Bess as the full weight of Emel's words hit her. Instantly, Bess knew it was too late to pretend. She had missed her window. She cursed herself for letting her emotions show so freely, for having a pitiful amount of self-control, for being so careless in public with Noor. Tell me this and I won't tell your mother. Emel said, tilting her out to the side. Bess was painfully conscious of the radio static of the calico cat bobbing along somewhere, of Muhammad behind the counter. He was ringing up someone's groceries. He could be hanging onto every word. Emel lowered her voice, asking into her ear, did she force you? She only had a moment to think. Yes, she said. Bess walked away before Emel could ask any more questions. She, she checked out with shaking fingers, placing the cans on the counter one by one. She was aware of Emma's eyes on her back the whole time. She barely heard Muhammad as he asked about her mother. She kept her eyes on the cans the whole time, on Muhammad's knobby, knobby brown hands as he placed them in the bags. This was a sign. Emma had been sent down as a lesson, a warning. Should she tell Noor? No, it was better not to rock the boat. It was better to keep going. When Bess's shadow bloated and shrank across the glassy storefront of Elf Leila, the hookah lounge on the corner, she said a prayer. It was the proximity of sin and temptation on the same street, hookah lounges and bars, a Marriott with an ever-revolving door, a mosque that made, sorry, um, that made her feel worse. When Bess was younger, she felt grateful as she passed these structures, grateful that she would never be inside of them, but that they existed to remind her of the straight path. At night, she prayed that God would always preserve her moral compass, her deep-rooted instinct, relish even, for being a believer. In middle school, she took her disinterest in boys as a sign of God's protection. When she saw Noor for the first time, her dark-rimmed green eyes in the back of the classroom, she knew she was wrong. The mosque came into view. Tiled in white, it shimmered like an oasis in the pale exhale of the early dawn. Bess took a breath and pulled back the golden door. It was cool inside. All three floors of the mosque, the rent for which was scraped together painstakingly each Ramadan, was carpeted in a thick forest green. When she was a child, Bess thought that this might be the same color as paradise, which she also saw as a three-story building. A verse from Surah Ibrahim ran through her mind, and the ones who have believed and done good deeds will enter gardens beneath which rivers flow. Fatima never liked Noor. It was on this floor four years ago that she had said this for the first time. Bess was 16, and Noor's family had just moved to Jackson Heights from Cairo. Bess had been laying out their prayer rugs on the green carpet, 
when Fatima brought up the subject. It was a muggy day in August, and the first floor ventilator, which had overseen generations of women, was in its third week of death throes. She's some type of way, Fatima whispered when Noor took form at the curtained entryway. Her voice mingled with the one coming out of the loudspeaker above, with the sputters and coughs of the ventilator, with the flapping of bulletin board flyers and street advertisements and school trip notices against plump, wet mom faces. Okay. Um. That was the beginning um, of the story. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I will now introduce a brilliant poet, Marlon Jenkins. Uh, Marlon M. Jenkins is the author of the chapbook Capable Monsters from Bull City Press. They live, write, and teach in Minnesota. I want to say, who could blame them? Who could blame them for how they burrowed out from the cave of bulbous airbags, dislodged bloody heads from Michelin man, embraced the blood, pollocked my car's hood as the first man stumbled by quick across, gone into the small woods opposite the highway off-ramp. The second man crawled onto the shattered glass and plastic littered concrete bystanders helping him to a patch of nearby grass. Somewhere back in the row of now still cars, someone in scrubs appeared to attend to him while others found and fished out the first man from the small forest. They are somehow convinced to wait. Again, I want to ask, but no, how easy to lay blame for their flight, their want to trip through tilted exit and run. How easy to resent the loud and bloody spectacle of screech and crash. In the movie version of this scene, they are indica lit and afraid the cops will find the open henny that fell from the passenger's lap when they seared through the exit ramp into the intersection. A close distance, sirens, somehow near immediately. In another similar dimension, the cops show up and one immediately tackles one man, new drips of red joining the current blood puddle. Meanwhile, a second cop unloads shots into the back of the other as he tries, as if in defiance of history, to find safety in the trees. I want to ask, what is the cost of hoping to receive care? I want to say, have you yet learned to run from your wreckage? Afraid one catastrophic act will beget another? Or have you been allowed to somehow salvage your wreck? I'm not going to talk very much because as confident as I am in the waterproofness of the mascara, I, uh, if I start crying, I won't stop. So I'm um, just very grateful. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the team. This poem is called From. I come from the blood that drips from the thumb cut on the opening of a beer can. That threshold of ledge between the air and a contained liquid, the thin opening that allows the drip lost in the rippling brown. I come from not the stone, but the stone's man-made sharp edge. The way a bone could be a club, could be fuel for the broth could be the structure held while human teeth rip flesh from a wing. I come from the salted sauce, the crushed garlic in a wooden bowl, a bowl of pickled turnips turning their edges to soft brown. I come from pronounced brows, from a land where some roll their R's and some drop them, where some stop in the dead of night to pray for cousins when the spirit hits. I come from a land hit by the spirit or spirits or bottles of liquor or the voices of God and ancestors, stories warping over time's indifferent swiftness. My mother went to a different country for her first marriage, moved to a new city after the ending of the second. My father Learn the loneliness a suburb washes us and swishes us around in its cheeks. 
In the river near where I'm from, there are many fish. And for them to live their best lives, it means I will never see them. They swim within the water's dark murk, beyond anything our vision can pierce. It is so tempting to tempt. It is so easy to miss history, so easy to miss the catch. When we played at the park, my father would throw the softball gentle, direct. It came for me. I flinched. Thank you. Um, this is my last poem, and then we'll, we'll keep on moving. This poem is called Glint. The deep rainbow of oil slicked in the supermarket parking lot calls to me with its dark beauty to step in and paint dirty my already worn white shoes. I camp the bonfires, reaching tongues ascended to try to lick the tree. I would throw whatever trash I had in to see what colors the garbage would burn, turn from waste to green or purple glow. Fall. The horse pulled a hay ride, and I traced the pattern indentations the straw left on my thighs. I can no longer see oil and not think of the ocean bloated with it, a duck or otter mucked with viscous liquid, now just black, not glinting. I can't see a horse without thinking of the bloody day when the marchers were met on the bridge and trampled baton and hoof making fragile work of brown encased bone. And how's that for nonviolence? Even the ocean catches fire with enough oil or gas. Even a gas can eat through an atmosphere or a lung. I can't stop clearing my dry throat. My groans sink into metronome, turn music to pain and itch. Nathaniel West, a lesser known modernist, writes, the physical world has a tropism for disorder, entropy. I can't stop building monuments to the chaos. I can't stop adoring the blood's cool crimson, how it insists on spilling out sometimes even from a small nick. I tell my psychiatrist, I've gotten very good at finding the beauty in this awful and awe-filled world, but it gets hard to feel it. The head can hold knowledge that the body rejects. Nathaniel, again, all order is doomed, yet the battle is worthwhile. I'm still reaching like that polluted fire. I hope if I reach the branch, I use it not to burn down, but to climb up. Okay, one of my favorite parts of doing a reading is the moment where I get to sit down and listen to the other brilliant readers. Um, so we'll move to our, our next reader. Vanessa Taylor is a writer with specific interest in surveillance, Afrofuturism, and the revolutionary potential of fiction. She's the curator of Nazar, an independent journalism project on surveillance, found, and founded The Drinking Gourd, a black Muslim literary magazine. Although based in Philadelphia, Minnesota will always be home. Please welcome Vanessa. All right. I will also be setting a timer, and we're going to see how much of the story I get through. Uh, but I'm just going to read my story from the journal. Uh, all right. So day five. The lottery, Umi says, isn't for people like us. This doesn't stop her from going out of the house each morning after Fedger. We're lucky. Our neighborhood's lottery site is a few blocks away. Umi's only got the speed walk to beat our neighbors. She used to help some of them. Practically dragged Miss Rivera down the sidewalk on day one when she fell down wailing about how unfair it all was. Which, yeah, all right. But crying doesn't make the earth alive again. Helping Miss Rivera was fine. After Umi scares some sense to her, talking about, don't you got a daughter, two months old, get off your ass so she has a chance, she could walk all right. But on day three, Umi got too charitable and stopped for Mr. Jones. His electric wheelchair had gone out ages ago. He'd been trying to wheel himself over, but he was tired, so she stepped in. They got held up because his wheelchair kept getting stuck in the snow. Lines start at 6 a.m. each morning, close at 6 p.m. 
Umi didn't get there until nearly 7.30 a.m. She came back without a single ticket for the house. Me, Umi, and Zach watched the lottery each day when it streamed at 7 p.m. Clap for the people whose names we knew. There weren't many. Zach's only three, so he doesn't know what's happening. Seeing us clap makes him run around squealing while me and Umi pretend the pits of our bellies aren't burning. Now Umi doesn't stop for nobody. The next day, on day four, Mr. Jones called her name. He was stuck and she left him there. Felt bad about it all day. Even though she's known our family since forever, Umi's move made Layla clear out the house. Then Umi slammed down a knife while preparing dinner, exclaimed shit and sucked her teeth. What use do people like Mr. Jones got for a ticket anyway? He could die next week, you know. People shouldn't be greedy. Day nine. There's a limit of four lottery tickets per household. It don't matter if your house is bigger than that. Layla's mama broke down in line on day six before we all knew how serious the officials were gonna be. Or maybe we knew, uh, but we were playing a fool's game, pretending they'd have some grace for us. I got three kids of my own. My husband's got two. She counted on her fingers as if the guard couldn't keep up with the math. Umi says the guard didn't even look at her. That's not surprising. But maybe Layla's mama thought it'd be different, because on day five, the guard was a black woman. And who else was going to care about black kids? Layla's mama held her shaking hands out. Seven fingers raised at first, and she shook her head, brought one hand back to her chest. She said, forget us. That's five kids. What am I going to do even if we went off all four tickets? How am I picking which kid gets left? When the guard didn't say anything, something shifted in Layla's mama. She's a quiet woman. She don't even cuss. She don't even tolerate her kids' roughhousing. But she tried grabbing that guard's shirt. Her face twisted up on itself like she couldn't decide if she was going to snarl or break. She settled for hissing out, and just because they gave you two tickets for selling your soul don't mean you're special. Show some compassion. Why not help me out? Let me call her stupid later, but I get it. It's like a little kid after they've been ignored all morning and start getting desperate to be seen again. They grab at any part of an adult they can reach. Pant leg, sleeve, dangling scarves. At worst, though, a kid gets backhanded, not whipped with the end of a rifle, and all her house banned from Exodus. On day eight, I saw Layla while taking Zach to the park. She looked to be in a mood, but fuck, I don't know. Thought it was me, so she'd be different. I wanted to go up and gossip with her. Pretend we're living how 17-year-olds should be. Our stilted conversation lasted a minute before Layla just started cackling. I'm sorry, Layla said in between gas of air. I can't do this. It's so fucked up, you know? But I hate you because you got a chance. And I'm thinking such mean things about you. I'm better than you. I'm smarter. I got more to offer. It should have been your crazy ass mama who... I slapped the shit out of her before she could finish speaking hard enough that it snapped her head back and her nose bled, left her trying to plug it with the edge of her hijab. I snatched Zach up onto my hip and stormed off. By the time I got home, though, I couldn't be mad. People are animals, aren't we? Animals do mean things when they get scared. Would I take it personally if a corner cat hissed at me? Day 15. There's been talk of getting city council to fix the lottery sites. People have been saying they aren't fair since the zoning maps went up. Almost a month into it, though, <laughs> nothing's going to change. It won't be up to city council anyway. Anything to do with the lottery has to be taken up with GF Explorations officials. People's problems with zonings differ. Zones aren't all sides the same, that's one. Our lottery site is meant to, for about half the north side. Meanwhile, some itty-bitty neighborhoods got two sites between them. There's been rumors that some get so few people that they give away leftover tickets. Musa swore, wallahi wallahi cuz, that he saw it happening after he got off work. But Musa's also been lying since before he could talk. Another issue, not everyone's side is close. Some people got to take the light rail or sit at a bus stop, cross their fingers and hope Metro Transit ain't running late, that the unpredictable snowfall won't stop the entire city. It's Minnesota, sure, but it's still July, the newscaster exclaims each and every time like it's surprising. Like I said, the lines open at 6 a.m. and close at 6 p.m., or once all the tickets are gone for the day. Since day 10, no lottery site has been open past 4 o'clock. The officials at GE call it a success. They say our perseverance, our willingness to stand hours in lines they haven't subjected themselves to, is a sign of good fortune for the United States' sector on Earth 2.0. Uh, that's not its real name, but who cares? 
Anyway, if you're not lined up by 6.30 a.m. nowadays, there's no point. Go home. Day 19. People are finding their way around the rules. GE can stop everyone from lining up before 6 a.m., but they can't keep people from endlessly lingering around ticket sites. At night, Minneapolis is a tent city. If he was around, I bet my old English teacher, Mr. Fritz, would reap about it. Perseverance, even when everything seems hopeless, that's the basis of a revolution. He loved finding beauty in shit people shouldn't have been living to start. I never understood it, still don't. When the saddles of tents arch in our windows, I don't see nothing worth swooning about. Umi doesn't cast a tent herself, says it's too dangerous, but she's leaving earlier and earlier. If she isn't first in line, then she's the fifth at max. The lines open up an hour before GE officials start handing out tickets. Before the building opens, hired guards keep watch. She started having me make breakfast for them. Not to brag on myself, but I can make some damn good egg sandwiches. Even Layla's picky ass brothers pick them up. The secret is using sweet potato biscuits and frying your eggs in duck fat. We don't eat duck like that at home, but I tried it at Sinise's a few years ago. There's nothing else on the sandwiches because it's hard enough feeding us three. Food's expensive, and there's no EBT anymore. What's the point of keeping up with programs like that? All that money can go towards getting people to the launch. You know, these aren't going to improve our chances, I told Umi the first time she kept me up to make a couple. I was bitter about giving away food. Being a good Muslim be damned. Guards were nothing but gassed up police, and besides, we were down to five biscuits. Weren't no more sweet potatoes or butter left. What was I going to do when we ran out? What parts of myself was I going to have to barter? The video I sent some man last time left me feeling so unclean, I must have made some 20 times. Omi snatched the sandwiches up. You think standing in that line is doing much either? We're not going to win if we go by chances. She was right. Minneapolis has got almost a million people now. GAE's only allocated 100 winning tickets. As Umi shoved the sandwiches into her bag, she added, I'm going to do whatever I can to make it happen for us. She's been out praying all night lately. I can see the grooves of thicker wearing themselves into her fingers. Whatever it takes. Day 25. On day 23, somebody leaked the demographic of the US's lottery winners so far. Over 85% white. That's not even counting the people who don't play the lottery like the rest of us. When Umi saw only 4% of winners were black, she laughed. I asked Zach why she even bothered going out there while bouncing him on her lap. But today, she went and lined up all the same. GE's got to be heated, though. Halfway through the lottery and someone had to fuck it up. Except there wasn't really much thought to it. This isn't like before. There aren't any public apologies or promises to do better. Diversity and inclusion was a joke before, but especially now. In about two weeks, almost all the people who are mad will be fucking dead anyway. Now we just know for certain how badly we got screwed over one last time. Even though the sun is out until 9 p.m. these days, I hustle Zachariah in at 2 p.m. every day. That's when lottery starts have started closing around here. Officials say it's because they don't have enough people to keep them open any later. There's rumors that's not true. Some people even say they're discarding tickets. Tire guards ripping them up and throwing them in the trash so nobody can claim them, even if one is a winner. All right. Okay. I got like 30 seconds left, so I'm going to cut it off there. <laughs> uh, but next, I'm really thrilled to introduce a poet whose work I've been following for quite some time. Uh, even though I don't live in Minnesota anymore. As I said, this is home, and I still keep track of what's going on up here. Uh, and so uh, Sigur Shahid is a black American Muslim poet from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and she's who y'all are going to hear from next. The ancestors of triggers started off as thick and hollow grass, bamboo chopped down and sculpted into a tiny cannon, which, if fed gunpowder, functions much like its descendants. Gunpowder started off as experimental fire medicine, possibly an elixir for life, sulfur, saltpeter, arsenic, honey, to make the hardiness of any aim projectile dance furious violently fly. 
these ancient books of kinship that never set out to find you. Brianna, the bullet that claimed your name, bullets that pierced through pots and pans, apartment walls and ceiling, sliding glass door, windows with the blinds shut down, bullets everywhere. There are pictures that circulate like spontaneous wildfires. Everywhere the police fired a weapon, canonizing imperial impetus to capture with cannon these violent void descendants of handheld cannons keep making of black women. You were an emergency room technician. This means you knew medicine in times of crisis, in times of extreme pain. You prepared IVs. Their slender stems like even smaller cannons firing away. I can't go further than that. Cannibalizing what your life was without also noticing my own mind participating alongside each handheld weapon all over again. You should be alive. So I wrote that poem and I wanted to recite it in remembrance of Brianna Taylor because her um, one of her murderers is um, uh, being rehired. And we have you know, uh, one of the murderers of Dante Wright who is being released um, um, soon or just got released. And so I just wanted to just keep Brianna Taylor's name on you all's mind and just share that. Um, and as someone who's directly impacted by the carceral um, system and who has relatives who have not survived that system, and I know a lot of us have direct connections, um, I wrote that poem just thinking about that, that violence, but also just to say Brianna's name again because she has not received justice. And then I'm gonna read two poems that are in this issue. And I'm so grateful to this issue because it's gorgeous and I hope you all got a copy. The editors are phenomenal and it's in a dream team issue and there's so many amazing writers. And I wish I had the great idea to position the next poem that I'm going to read this way, but I love that the poem as it's positioned in the issue um, kind of directs you to reposition yourself to read it. And so this poem is called, Isn't That the Trouble with Staring Too Hard at Joy? I want to dwell in tonight with you until this dimension is submerged somewhere deep within the folds of my bottom lip's womb, enclave the size of a baby tortoise shell. I'm only pretending to be trapped by that summery night. You pitched a white sheet against the mouth of your garage and it became a canvas painting the film's flickering tongue from the projector's glass membrane. We fell asleep that way, with the movie still on, like two plump silkworms in the grass, a banquet of sunflower seeds shucked between us, a canopy of mosquitoes concentrating on our flesh, our flesh concentrates on a canopy of Mosquitoes like plump silkworms in. The grass, we fell asleep. Moving films flickering. Tongue from to be trapped. By that summery night, I want to dwell in tonight with you. I am only a premonition to love that is, to love that is, to love that is, to love, love, love that is. Until this whole dimension is submerged somewhere. Within a memory's fold. Isn't that the trouble? It's staring too hard. And it becomes a carcass. Can you guys show some love to Fada Habad, who's a local poet who helped me out with that poem? I had no idea how to read brackets, and I was like, Fada, can you help me? Fada is also an amazing community organizer, and you can look up Fada um, in the community, and also Fada has a book of poetry that I enjoy, so support local artists as well. Thank you. One more poem, and then we'll get to someone I'm really excited to introduce. 
And this poem, um, sometimes I give titles to things as like a joke, and I don't think that anyone's going to let me keep it. And they let me keep this. <laughs> or like a joke for me. Or <laughs> So anyways, but this is called, because I, like, my brother is here, and I'm like shocked. Thank you all for being here. Like, I feel like half my, I feel like half my family is here. <laughs> like, it's so lovely. Um, and so we, my brother and I grew up in a Sufi household. Um, and we like sang a lot of casitas um, and performed the Khadra and things of that nature. And so this next poem is kind of thinking about that um, as like black Americans and also thinking about like music. And so it's called Casita that might as well spend some time with these Negro spirituals. <laughs> right? <laughs> is music only haram when not sung in that tongue? Can you not see these winded guzzles becoming gospels? The phrase, she finna take you to church, might mean her voice was so sacred. We were raptured despite agony. It might also mean she finna take you to church. When you laugh, you pause, you pause to catch breath. When you recite Ayat al-Kursi, you pause to catch breath. When you recite Hafiz, you pause to catch breath. When you sing al Burda, you pause to catch breath. When I hear, lift every voice and sing, I pause to catch breath. That restlessness, stirring, unwheeling, unwelled within my ribs cage, hear a song mapping out all that has tried to drown us, my people, or can't you listen? Okay. I'm excited. <laughs> this is the best part. I'm so excited to introduce this next person because I was like stalking them on the internet a little bit and like um, it's such a joy um, to introduce Sama Fadl, who is an Afro-Palestinian writer, editor, and translator who resides in um, Totika, Montreal. Um, Sama is interested in showcasing black Swana experiences through storytelling, poetry, and visual art, and is also just a talented poet. I'm so excited. Please, warm world applause for Sama. Wow, hello, everyone. So happy to be here. Thank you for coming out. I'd love to first start by sharing um, a short story I, I wrote, kind of to honor the choices that our ancestors made that kind of still impact us to this day. This is to honor my um, Grandmothers, great-grandmothers, it's a story that's inspired by theirs, and it's called The Night Journey. The pen exploded through her crisp white shirt. The ink bled through and spread like the microcosm of a galaxy onto the polyester. And the girl remembered her small thumb staining as she held a copy of the newspaper. Her grandmother demanded she read it when the girl visited her in Gaza in the summer of 1999. Iqra'i, she said. Read. She tilted her ear toward the girl to hear better and questioned her on the meaning behind every letter. As she stuttered through the Arabic calligraphy, the girl remembered the story about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when an angel visited him in the night and demanded he read the word of God. She wondered about how nervous he might have been then, if he felt the same way she did now. Her sweat released the ink from the page and imprinted onto her skin for the rest of the trip. She wanted nothing more than to disappear in that moment. But all she did was leave prints of her DNA all over her grandmother's walls. Her grandmother saw shapes made of ink as a child too, printed on paper brought by outsiders, and decided she would come to understand them. She was born a dark-skinned Bedouin girl with nothing but the sand at her feet and the wisdom of her ancestor stories at her tongue. She wondered if the tales on paper were like, were like the ones she heard from her mother, like the story about her late husband 
a wandering man who traveled from Ethiopia to Sudan to Cairo, finding work on the brand new railway extending from Cairo to Damascus. He would work six days a week and sometimes get rest in Yaffa, a bustling port city in Palestine. He would get off to eat and pray with the locals, sit by the market and eat fresh figs, watch the Bedouins arrive on Fridays, hundreds of them at a time. This is how he first met her, when she traveled to the market with her brothers on camel. And he knew right then he was going to spend the rest of his life with her. In Yaffa, he found a place to build a family, take a moment, and gaze at the stars. They reminded him of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his divine voyage to Jerusalem when he saw the universe from heaven above. He would often tell his children about this tale. They would ask if by soaring up so high he was able to touch the stars. And he wondered if in traveling so much the Prophet ever felt like he'd found a home. Her husband passed and left behind his wife and three children. The eldest begged to learn the meaning behind the shapes that were printed on paper. But she was not a boy, so the tribe refused her. Her mother refused their refusal. Some say she went mad with grief. But now that her husband was gone, what reason was there for her not to leave? She escaped on a mule under the cover of night her three little children right behind. They somehow made it to the city and her mother knocked on a door. A known Bedouin family answered. She had sewn thopes for them before. She did not ask for charity, but rather honest work and lodging. They accepted and for a moment they were out of harm's way. Her daughter had even begun to learn the shapes made of ink day by day. But a year later, the tribe found her. And it wasn't long before they were taken back to the desert. The girl was told she would never have to read again. And the mother almost died by challenging all of them. She held her sword up high and pleaded with the sheik, told him she would end this by the blade if it meant her daughter could understand the ink. In the end, he could not deny her tenacity. Or was it the madness of a mother's love he saw lurking behind her eyes? He let her go and forbade anyone from following them. She traveled back to the city, this time truly free, her eldest daughter looking up at the same stars her late father did. The same stars that shone on him were the ones that shone on her. And they were the same stars the prophet once saw from heaven above. For a moment, she felt as if they were all kindred spirits. He was illiterate and became a prophet. Surely, in spite of it all, she could manage. The girl learned not only to read, but to think with reason. She grew up and decided she was going to study medicine. She became the first black head nurse in all of Palestine. Knowledge coursed through her veins, and she eventually had children who had children. She told them her stories the same way her mother did with her and made sure they understood the meaning behind every word. The girl became the grandmother. Her daughters grew obsessed with language and became teachers. They vowed to repeat the stories they had heard through her. Even through exile, they opened a center for learning in a city next to the one their grandfather would always pray in. Once their children were old enough to understand, they told them about the stories woven by their grandmother's hands. Some of them could only visit on rare occasion. One time, their little niece left prints of ink while on vacation. And as the pen released all of its contents through her crisp white shirt, spreading like the microcosm of a galaxy onto the polyester, the girl burst out laughing as she remembered how nervous she was the day her grandmother demanded she read the newspaper. She thought she had angered her by what she had done, but her grandmother made sure never to scrub the thumbprints off those walls.
that was the story. <laughs> I'd like to read a poem from the issue. Um, it's called, And Then a Palestinian Was Born. Cleansing souls to Rome's twisted roads, paved on stones thrown from Bethlehem. Death came from sin, and he was adorned. It was then that a Palestinian was born brown shaded and hairy, prickly as the fruit, planted at the root. I search for its name, yet bloody pulp pursues. A memory I describe to try and remember. Instead, salted earth and fog rubble my brain. Unimaginable if I had grown on the tilth of the soil, meant to toil the mulch of our germinating grains ground that begat us, bespoke, then be gone with us. The mud asks where I am with the patience of man and the same sleight of hand I remember. I remember. The Arabic word for patience is sabr. Sabr, the name of the fruit I'd forgotten. Sabr I can no longer extend. Sabr grows where European trees wither. Sabr is every checkpoint from West Bank to Rafa. Sabr asks me where I've gone and I don't know where to start. My parents were the ones who played in its shadow in the dark, holding hands with its stem, withstanding occupation out of scorn. It was in those moments that a Palestinian was born. When even our flag they could not bear to see and denied us the pride of a culture's dignity when Sabir was gone, we took watermelon seeds, planted them, grew symbols, and ate them piece by piece, scooping juicy flesh beneath thin layers of green, digging out an escape for those meant to be free. Our politics a spoon carved out of stone. It is with a rock in hand that a Palestinian is born. <laughs> Thank you, and I believe that concludes our reading portion of the night, so give a shout out to everybody who came up on stage. <laughs>